Good evening, and thank you for joining tonight's virtual town hall that will address questions regarding the clinical guidance document for the care of adult patients with rheumatic diseases during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Ellen Gravelisi, president of the American College of Rheumatology, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this town hall along with my colleague, Ken Sag, secretary of the college. Tonight's town hall is being recorded so that it can make, be made widely available. So before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to provide some background as to how we got here. To address the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic, the ACR Executive Committee formed a clinical guidance task force to address the care of patients with rheumatic diseases during this pandemic. This task force included experts in infectious diseases, epidemiology, and experts in biologic and non-biologic therapies used for rheumatic diseases. The clinical guidance document produced by the task force was approved by the ACR Board of Directors at the end of April. The recommendations provided are part of what we view as a living document, recognizing that additional data is evolving rapidly and that there is an anticipated need for updates to these recommendations as new evidence becomes available. A manuscript is also available now in arthritis and rheumatology. Next slide. I'd like to recognize our task force members uh, listed on this slide, including our experts in infectious diseases, highlighted in blue. And I'm also pleased to introduce our six members of the task force, next slide, who will be participating as panelists in the town hall tonight. Ted Michaels from the University of Nebraska, who chaired the task force and is a senior author on the guidance document. Karen Kostenbader from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Michael Weinblatt, also from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Bonnie Burmis from UT Southwestern. Stanley Cohen from Rheumatology Associates in Dallas. And Kevin Winthrop from Oregon Health and Science University. And I'd like to turn the evening over now to Ted Michaels, who will be leading tonight's discussion. Um, so I want to thank Ken and Ellen uh, for their leadership on this. And I also want to point out that as we were charged uh, with developing uh, this guidance document by the ACR, there were some guiding principles uh, that we agreed on very early. And those guiding principles um, were that we our charge was to develop a guidance document for the care of adult rheumatic disease patients, and not per se to provide guidance for the treatment of COVID-19. Obviously our task and our development of guidance would be based on scant data. And as Ellen mentioned, this would be, we, we anticipate this being a living document that would change uh, and be added to over time. Obviously like all guidance documents, this is not meant to replace clinical judgment. And our goal was to align this effort with other efforts uh, supported by the ACR, including efforts from the Practice and Advocacy Task Force that many of you have likely heard about, and also the uh, work that's being done uh, by the Global Rheumatology Alliance. Um, the first task that our group was given was to develop an evidence report. And you can see an example here of what uh, we developed. This was done by breaking into four subgroups and we covered uh, different aspects uh, of COVID-19 based on different phases of the disease. And I would point out here that this is not a systematic review. And different than other guideline efforts, um, th this uh, didn't include the detailed and rigorous methodology that one would see with a formal guideline effort that often takes months or even years uh, to develop. We uh, generated guidance statements and examined those um, using modified Delphi approach based on the uh, RAND UCLA appropriateness method. This included at least, uh, or excuse me, it included two rounds of asynchronous anonymous uh, voting that was done electronically. And we developed guidance statements that were then voted on by the panel, as I mentioned, both in terms of uh, measures of agreement and measures of consensus. And um, the consensus really was a reflection on the dispersion of the votes in terms of how strongly uh, uh, the group uh, agreed with statements. So the process, um, as many of you have read or seen uh, in the document, 
uh, culminated in 25 uh, guidance statements. Uh, I'm showing here the first group of statements and the level of consensus that was achieved. And these covered uh, different aspects, again, of rheumatic disease care in the context of the pandemic. And this first group shown um, include general recommendations specific to risk assessment, uh, prevention of infection, and best practices relevant to glucocorticoid use and the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs uh, during the pandemic. We developed additional uh, guidance statements. And these uh, shown uh, address treatment of rheumatic disease patients um, in the absence of infection or known exposure. And you can see we developed guidance specific to the treatment of lupus in the context of the pandemic. We also provided guidance uh, for treatment that was specific to newly diagnosed patients or those with active rheumatic disease. And finally, we developed guidance statements uh, specific to rheumatic disease patients who had experienced a community-related uh, SARS-CoV-2 exposure or those who had documented or presumptive COVID-19. So the next steps, as Ellen mentioned uh, early in this, is that we do anticipate changes will be made as evidence rapidly evolves uh, in this arena. The updates will include, as shown here, already included topics. We also expect uh, new questions to be addressed as evidence evolves. So this question is for our hydroxychloroquine experts. Uh, the question that was asked by uh, someone ahead of time is, what do we know about the cardiovascular safety of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine in rheumatic disease in general? And is this a problem in the setting of COVID-19? And I'm going to ask our panelist, Bonnie Burmes, to begin uh, answering this question. And then we'd like to hear from Karen Kostenvader. Thank you, Ellen. There's been little evidence of cardiovascular risk in, in rheumatology patients taking antimalarials such as hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Um, amongst the handful of case reports of arrhythmia in the literature, those have included one patient with an intentional drug overdose and a patient who had significant coexisting cardiac disease and who was older and quite ill. And I think that um, we have not seen in our field uh, cardiac safety signals using these medications for um, treatment, nor have there been any safety sign signals in the hundreds of thousands of patients who've been given these medications for malarials. In COVID-19, there have been a bunch of reports of arrhythmia after hydroxychloroquine use, and this is thought to be um, mediated through the prolongation of the QT interval and it's ex exacerbated by the co-administration of medications such as azithromycin. The patients, however, it's important to note that um, have had COVID-19 uh, that have developed arrhythmias after antimalarial use have been quite ill and have had other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And as I mentioned, many of them are also receiving um, azithromycin that also can contribute to arrhythmias. Thus, the risk of cardiac toxicity in COVID-19 infected patient is likely to be significantly different than in our patients who are not, when not infected with COVID-19. Um, nonetheless, given the recent press on this issue, assessing cardiac risk of antimalarials in our patients may be an important area for us to think about in terms of future study. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Karen Kostenbader, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the known benefits of hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, thanks. I think that that's, that answer was spot on, and I totally agree that um, it, how fast, I'd just like to reiterate that these are evolving guidelines, and just a couple weeks ago, we were more concerned about the national shortage of hydroxychloroquine and the fact that it was being used very liberally for treatment of COVID and prevention of COVID and what to do about our patients who didn't have access to it. And now we've come really, the pendulum swung the other way. And because of these uh, safety signals that are seen primarily in very ill patients with COVID taking hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and the increased risk of arrhythmias, now we're concerned about our rheumatic disease patients in a different way. Is there a risk uh, with hydroxychloroquine? And I think anecdotally, and um, we've done some searching of the literature, we really have not seen this in rheumatic disease patients. And we've treated a lot of rheumatic disease patients, probably with lower doses. 
in different situations than this over the years. But I agree that it does need to be studied further in the future, and I'm sure there will be studies coming out in rheumatic disease patients. And I did want to just reiterate all the known benefits of hydroxychloroquine and how much we, for lupus, we really love it. We think about grabbing hydroxychloroquine and starting it almost immediately. If we're thinking of a, of a connective tissue disease, and we don't know exactly if it's mixed connective tissue disease or lupus or, or rheumatoid arthritis, it's the ideal drug. Usually in terms of our armamentarium of medications, it's real, relatively non-toxic and it has known benefits. It's, it really is disease stabilizing in lupus, it prevents flares and those, that's been proven in trials published in the New England Journal. If you, if you stop hydroxychloroquine, you will have more flares of, of subsequent lupus. Uh, it also has other benefits of preventing uh, renal disease in lupus. It uh, prevents thrombosis in lupus. Uh, it maybe prevents uh, diabetes and lowers blood sugars. It lowers lipids. Uh, it's very good for skin rashes. So it has many, many known. Um, oh, and how could I forget when, with Bonnie right here? That is, it's very good in pregnancy. And you can use it during um, pregnancy. So there are a lot of great features about hydroxychloroquine. We use, we use chloroquine less. Uh, they use it more in uh, dermatology for skin rashes and uh, diseases. Um, but I think we all have to be vigilant and uh, especially, you know, those epic pop-ups about drug interactions and QT prolongation, I think we'll take them more seriously now, especially about mm -hmm. interactions. Azithromycin uh, is a big offender apparently, um, and there'll probably be better studies coming out in the future about risks in our own uh, rheum disease patients. Well, thanks a lot, Bonnie and Karen. Are there any other comments from the panel? So we love the drug, but we are going to watch this rapidly evolving story. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go on to the next question. So this question is for Ted. We have a series of questions for you, Ted. Um, this question is, is there data suggesting that DMARDs or biologics impact risk of COVID-19 incidence or its natural course in patients with rheumatic disease? Thanks, Ellen. So there's obviously been a lot of interest uh, in our medicines and uh, efforts to even examine our medicines in, in, uh, as being repurposed for, in COVID-19. The bottom line, though, is currently there really isn't evidence that either our rheumatic diseases or treatments we use in our rheumatic diseases in, impact COVID-19 incidents or outcomes. There's certainly a growing body of literature, a rapid growing body of literature. You're gonna hear that over and over tonight. Um, there was a recent uh, case series from uh, NYU involving 86 patients with inflammatory diseases, kind of a mix of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, IBD, and related illnesses. In the population of 86 patients, a majority of those were on either biologic or JAK inhibitors. And even in the context of, of aggressive therapy, those patients experienced hospitalization rates, all had COVID-19. And there was hospitalization rates that really were very similar to what's been seen in the background uh, New York population, suggesting that even in a, a group of uh, inflammatory disease patients, rheumatic disease patients being aggressively treated, we see outcomes that are generally reflective uh, of the population. There was another study that recently came out um, from the Lombardy region of Italy looking at psoriasis in over 1,100 uh, biologic users, um, showing that actually biologic use in that study was associated with a higher incidence of symptomatic COVID-19. But in terms of outcomes, there was no increased risk, at least statistical increased risk in those patients in terms of um, uh, ICU stay, development of ARDS or mortality, suggesting that severe outcomes were no worse in those patients, although they were more likely to develop symptomatic COVID. So this is an area that's uh, rapidly moving and one we're going to need to keep our eyes uh, very closely on um, as data emerges. Thanks very much, Ted. So we have another question for Ted. Uh, this is about the guidelines. Can these guidelines be extrapolated to the pediatric population? Um, so great question and, and one that's come up. And I would just remind um, folks tonight that our charge uh, on the task force was specifically to develop guidance for adult uh, rheumatic disease patients. 
obviously I, I think the, um, the impetus for that was uh, a sense of urgency and really early data, um, both out of China and Italy, uh, suggesting that pediatric patients at much lower risk for incident COVID-19 and much lower risk, fortunately, in many ways, for poor outcomes from COVID-19. And so uh, the initial efforts were directed uh, to our task force to develop uh, guidance for adult patients. I would say that, you know, in, in my opinion, clearly um, uh, got, this guidance shouldn't be necessarily extrapolated to pediatric patients, um, just like I wouldn't extra extrapolate rheumatoid arthritis guidelines to JIA uh, patients. Uh, I would, you know, I'd be awfully careful in uh, extrapolating these or generalizing these to pediatric uh, populations. Thanks, Ted. And I would add that um, we, of course, are going to be updating these guidelines, and this is a priority for the next round of guidelines to ask our pediatric colleagues to begin to develop guidelines for their patients as well. Uh, we have one more question for you, Ken. I mean, Ted, sorry. Uh, what is the rationale for discontinuing traditional DMARDs, such as methotrexate, with COVID-19 infection? Yeah, I think this is a great question, and one maybe uh, if you just read the guidance statements isn't terribly intuitive. Um, you know, we talk about whether conventional DMARDs, methotrexate in weekly dosing, sulfasalazine, are those, uh, leflunamide, are those immunosuppressive? And I think clearly the answer for an agent like sulfasalazine is probably not a, an immunosuppressive agent. So why would one hold those in the context of COVID-19 infection? I think the task force felt that um, with a COVID-19 uh, positive patient, with a patient who's infected, that there is a, a, would be a concern of potentially confusing adverse effects related to medicines or conflate those with problems from the infection. So examples of that might be, although rare, uh, drug-induced hypersensitivity, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or gastrointestinal side effects or hepatitis, all that have been described in uh, COVID-19. And not only could it cause confusion, maybe worsen uh, those the sequelae of COVID-19. I think the other part of this answer was that the panel really felt that the risk in terms of flaring of the underlying rheumatic disease was likely to be pretty low given the uh, finite time frame we'd be talking about. Usually, a time frame of two to three weeks, uh, you'd be holding uh, the agent. So um, I think combining those is really why the task force ended up uh, uh, with that recommendation. Okay, thanks very much, Ted. So we're gonna go on to the next question, which uh, addresses rituximab. We've received a number of questions from our members about rituximab. I'm gonna direct this one to Michael Weinblatt. Should special precautions be taken with the use of rituximab during the pandemic, given the importance of viral antibody responses in protection against infection? Well, Ellen, that, that is a great question. Um, and the task force spent a lot of time talking about the rituxan issue um, with regard to viral antibody response. I mean, one of the issues with rituximab is it has a very prolonged biological effect. Um, so we don't know how long the biological activity exists with this molecule from when you first dosed it. I think we came on again to the side of what's best for the patient. And our bias was, uh, since there's very little data obviously, is that in a patient with well-controlled rheumatoid arthritis, if you could delay the next rituximab infusion until they actually showed a significant flare, that would be worthwhile. But however, in patients with life-threatening disease, such as vasculitis, lupus, nephritis, et cetera, we basically decided it was, more, it was important to treat the underlying rheumatic disease issues and not delay the infusions. Mm -hmm. So a risk-benefit analysis for rituximab. Yeah, absolutely. With all of our drugs, it's a risk-benefit analysis, and particularly with this molecule, since the biological activity can last years. All right, thank you, Michael. So we're going to go now to Ken Sag. Ken has been monitoring the Q&A box and has been looking at questions that are coming in from the audience. 
So Ken, I'll turn it over to you if we have two questions uh, that you've chosen either to answer or to ask the panelists to answer. Well, well, thank you, Ellen. We've actually been getting a lot of great questions. It's hard to pick just two initially, but um, we've had a few more about uh, hydroxychloroquine, and I'm going to ask those to uh, Bonnie and, and Karen. Uh, the first one is about the need for a baseline EKG, not something that uh, rheumatologists have typically been doing with hydroxychloroquine. Is that something we should be doing, and is it something we should be doing if we're thinking about hydroxychloroquine, particularly in this setting. The other related question is, is if a person is on hydroxychloroquine with rheumatic disease and develops COVID, should we be more worried about them having an arrhythmia and do we need to do any special monitoring in that circumstance? Okay, Bonnie, do you want to take this one or do you want me to try? We can share it. You can go first. So Bonnie's married to a cardiologist, so, um, <laughs> but I can, I can try. I think um, we think we did not discuss this, as I was saying, um, when we were uh, speaking about and addressing these questions in this guidance document. So this is very rapidly evolving. And it has not been pr standard practice to get an EKG prior to starting hydroxychloroquine for our patients for many, many years. And I think this is a very rapidly evolving um, situation with COVID where we're seeing these safety signals and arrhythmias. And we're all questioning whether we should have been getting uh, EKGs. And we really don't know that. And I think Bonnie and I have reviewed the literature and there's very little literature about um, arrhythmias in our patients. I think again, um, interactions with other medications and QT prolonging medications, antidepressants, antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, those increase the risk of doing this. I think there will be um, emerging research that will show us whether our rheumatic disease patients are, are at risk for QT prolongation and arrhythmias. Uh, probably not to the same extent. I would very much doubt to the same extent we would have seen it um, is COVID-19 in patients who are very, very ill. It might be something about the virus. Um, as to whether um, we, you know, our guidance document uh, says that it's okay. We, we were all in very strong agreement to continue hydroxychloroquine for inpatients with um, COVID-19 because at that point, just a couple weeks ago, we thought it was part of the potential treatment. And now the pendulum swung the other way and we're worried about maybe we shouldn't be continuing it because um, COVID-19 patients will be getting many other medications. Um, they will not be getting azithromycin because the, the pendulum swung the other way on that one too, but definitely on any other medications and they are sick. So potentially if uh, the rheumatic disease is under good control, the inpatient physicians could, could decide whether they should continue or not. If um, the, the COVID-19 is uh, a mild uh, disease, I, I would say we probably could continue in accordance with what we put in the, the um, guidance document, but we will have to revisit this as well. And I don't know what, Bonnie has to say to, to add to that. Bonnie, do you have any additional comments? No, I, I completely agree with what Karen said. I think there, these are distinct situations. In our lupus patients who are simply on hydroxychloroquine, I think we need to explore this further, but I don't think there are enough data right now to suggest that we need to be getting baseline EKGs on all patients. We haven't historically done it and it hasn't been an issue. I think that in patients that are on hydroxychloroquine, that um, are gonna be started on another medication that potentially prolongs the QT interval as thought to be the mechanism with the anti-malarials, that would probably be a patient. Sure, it seems like a reasonably good sound thing to get a baseline EKG if you're combining two QT prolonging medications. Patients who are outpatients of COVID, I would consider the same as patients who you're having on hydroxychloroquine and probably don't need an EKG, but those patients who get admitted to the hospital, sick enough to get admitted to the hospital are already in a different category of patient. And we don't know what COVID-19 is doing to the myocardium or the cardiac tissue, whether that's contributing. And certainly in those patients who are admitted, I would get an EKG, which is, I think, exactly what Karen just said. Great. Thank you very much. Let me uh, pose another one. I think, uh, Ted, I'll have you start with this one and then... Uh, if you want to pass it along to somebody else, please do. But there's a question about uh, disease activity and how we should account for disease activity among uh, different rheumatic diseases in making uh, decisions about stopping our disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs 
during the different scenarios, exposure with COVID, what, uh, how is that considered by the panel? We talked actually quite a bit, Ken, about disease activity, and I think that underpinned, as Michael mentioned earlier, really underpinned our uh, guidance around continuing uh, most therapies, all therapies, really in the context of stable disease in the absence of either a community exposure or infection. And that really looked to data that we have, not in COVID-19, but in other infections, the disease activity itself is a major risk for serious infection. We have you know, very good data on that in rheumatoid arthritis. We have similar data in lupus that disease activity portends risk. Um, we, so you know, that was, was a strong consideration in those recommendations. Obviously, it's a balance. Um, uh, you know, so for patients who present with organ-threatening, life-threatening disease, uh, you know, it, it is in many of those situations, as part of a risk-benefit assessment, as part of a shared decision-making process, the right decision may be to continue such therapy, continue immunosuppression, continue high-dose steroids in patients who have severe illness. And that again speaks to the panel's recognition that controlling systemic inflammation is a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, we obviously couldn't uh, account for every disease activity measure that's available in the, you know, many diseases we see, but uh, clearly disease control is a major aspect of, of prevention in terms of COVID-19. Great. Well, Ellen, I'm going to pass it back to you, and we can take some more questions that have come in earlier, and then uh, please continue to submit your questions on the Q&A chat. Okay, thanks very much, Ken. Um, so now we're going to go to an issue that the panel took on, uh, which is the use of JAK inhibitors. And this one I'm going to turn to Stan Cohen. Um, Stan, should special precautions be given with JAK inhibitors, given the reports of thromboembolic disease complicating the course of COVID-19? Okay, so this question is alluding to the reports that have come out recently about increased uh, incidence or risk of VTEs and pulmonary embolism in patients with COVID-19. It's not clear yet whether this uh, incidence or risk is greater than other critically ill patients, but certainly being reported, and I think we've all seen this in our vasculitis patients and uh, severely infected patients who are at greater risk. The easy part to this question is that we've, uh, the committee uh, put, suggested that patients are on JAK inhibitors who have uh, COVID-19, that JAK inhibitors should be discontinued anyway, similar to other uh, immunosuppressive therapies and non-IL-6 uh, biologics. So the JAK inhibitors should be uh, discontinued. Uh, we are aware of uh, a potential signal with baricitinib and the placebo control trials of an increased risk of VTEP. And then the recent uh, report on a cardiovascular outcome study looking at patients 50 and older with cardiovascular risk factors with higher dose tofacitinib and to a lesser degree the dose we're using in the United States, five milligrams BID, increased the risk of uh, thromboembolic events, primarily P uh, PEs with a trend towards uh, uh, venous thromboembolism as well. So uh, again, the easy answer here is that uh, the JAK inhibitor should be discontinued uh, when someone has uh, COVID-19 infection, uh, not so much because of the risk of thromboembolic disease, but concerns over immunosuppression uh, that uh, these drugs uh, carry with them. And also uh, the fact that uh, the JAK inhibitors are potent inhibitors of um, type 1 interferons, which play a significant role in uh, innate viral immunity and could potentially have a negative impact. And then just to finish up on the flip side, there is interest in uh, some of the JAK inhibitors as potential treatments uh, for COVID-19. And uh, there have been some anecdotal reports with baricitinib and actually clinical trials that are on clintrials.gov that are planned. Uh, and I, I don't believe they've yet started, but are, are going to get uh, potential benefit in this uh, disease. Okay, thank you very much, Stan, for that really very thorough answer. Um, we go on to the next question. Um, this question is for Kevin Winthrop. Is Kevin on? I'm not sure if we have Kevin with us. Um, if yeah, not, no, I'm here. Can you hear me? Are yes. Okay, great. So, Kevin, this question is for you. <clears throat> Following COVID-19, 
When can medicines that were held, such as DMARDs, biologics, immunosuppressive agents, be restarted? And does repeat COVID-19 testing inform this decision? So sure, that's a good question. Um, that's a question I'm asked quite a bit. Uh, that's not a question I said that we considered formally as a, as a group in our, in our guidance uh, process. Uh, it is something I think we, we should consider uh, as we're going through this living document process. Um, I can tell you what I, what I think um, personally and what uh, the kind of recommendations are out there. Um, there's really just one study, it's a small study of nine or ten patients from Germany that was published several weeks ago and it, you know, it talked about, uh, we were all concerned about the prolonged shedding that's been noted in a number of these people. People can shed um, uh, virus or be RNA positive from their nasopharynx or oropharynx for, you know, up to 30 plus days uh, in some cases, even after resolution of symptoms. But this one study was able to show that that the viability of that virus or the ability of the virus to infect cells and cell culture um, seems to go away after about seven days uh, post-resolution of symptoms. So a lot of us have adopted this idea that after seven days post-resolution of symptoms, uh, most people, if not all people, aren't, aren't infected. Uh, I've been waiting for further studies. I mean, again, this is one study with a small number of people, so it'd be nice to get another study out there uh, looking at this. But that's, um, that is the basis for that um, recommendation so far. That's the recommendation that I'm using that, uh, with patients that I think it's probably uh, safe for them to start seven days post-resolution of symptoms. Um, in cases where there uh, are no symptoms, it's a little bit less clear. Uh, a lot of people resort to the 14 days uh, after their positive test uh, in lack of symptoms. But, you know, most people who tested at this point have have had symptoms, so that's uh, less of an issue. Um, repeat COVID-19 testing. So the second part of this question, that, that is also a good question, not, not something we formally uh, discussed as a group, um, but it's something we should. There, there are lots of people doing repeat testing in special circumstances uh, before discharge from a hospital to a nursing home, for example, or you know, other scenarios. I think most of uh, us, and us meaning uh, me and my ID colleagues who just, all we do is you know, email and talk to each other all day about these things. Uh, most of us feel that repeat testing is probably not that helpful. Um, the sensitivity and specificity of the test is an issue. Uh, the issue that I just mentioned with regard to um, you know, prolonged shedding doesn't necessarily equate to uh, infectivity or, or ability to transmit or the ability to get sick from the virus. So we, we're, we're pretty, um, I, I can't really see a, a rationale for repeat testing before putting someone on a, a biologic I, or, or a DMAR in any of the drugs we're talking about today. I, I think I'd probably stick with this seven days uh, post-resolution of symptoms. Okay, thanks very much, Kevin. I wonder if I can extend that question slightly um, we're talking about repeat testing, and I wondered if you could just make a few comments about antibody testing, about the presence of antibodies in a patient. Does that protect the patient from getting COVID-19 again? Uh, what about looking for neutralizing antibodies? Is that something that the ID community thinks is going to be useful going forward? Is sure. Those are all great questions. Um, you know, uh, some, some patients do develop neutralizing antibodies. I think Ken, uh, Ken's cousin did, and this was all over the news, so I'm not disclosing something that's not public. Uh, not everyone does. Um, you know, I, I think that there are some limited data in, in trials showing that, you know, the use of um, antibodies from patients who've had the infection does seem to promote survival. So I think there's some uh, basis for the idea in humans as well as animal models, uh, i.e. macaques, non-human primate models, that the antibodies do uh, promote protection. You know, how long that protection lasts is another question and, we, and how completed it is, so that's another question we just don't know. Um, in terms of the antibody tests out there, Ellen, it's kind of the wild west right now. I mean, there's, there's lots of them being offered. I had 
you know, the guy down the street offered me one personally for like 150 bucks as I was jogging by him. I mean, I, don't, <laughs> I politely declined, uh, but there's that kind of stuff going on out there. Some of them are fake tests, some of them are real. Even the real tests, um, the characteristics of the tests are far from clear most of the time in terms of sensitivity and specificity. I think it's pretty clear that there is cross-reactivity in some of these tests. Um, you know, causing false positives. People can have antibodies and those antibodies are either due to nothing or potentially other coronaviruses that they've been exposed to before. So, so I think that both the sensitivity and specificity of those tests are, are not necessarily well understood and not probably as good as we want them to be. Um, that being said, there, there are some nice data in the last week or two showing, showing what we would like to see, you know, an early rise of IgM several days after infection, and then an IgG response that starts coming up several days later, and the IgM response, you know, fades before the IgG response. Uh, we don't have really long-term data, though, in terms of how, how long the IgG response lasts, and again, it's protectiveness, we, we don't really know. So I, I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. A lot of this uh, COVID-19 does feel like a lot of so we have another question for you, Kevin. <clears throat> Do you recommend COVID-19 testing for asymptomatic patients with an exposure, such as family members? Uh, COVID-19 testing for asymptomatic patients with an exposure. Um, you know, again, this wasn't a question we, we formally uh, discussed as a group, but. Um, you know, we, I think we talked more about what to do with, you know, management of therapy around the setting. Sorry, my nurse is um, calling me here. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, someone who's a suspect, meaning if they've been exposed to a case, uh, I certainly would uh, test them at some point. You know, the question is when, when you test them. I mean, you can't test them every day for 14 days to see if they turn positive. So, I mean, someone who's had a... Uh, someone who is asymptomatic and has been uh, exposed, um, you know, probably uh, actually you're not going to test them unless they get symptomatic. You're going to ask them to stay quarantined for 14 days and stay away from the, the person they were exposed uh, who had documented disease. If they become symptomatic, certainly you're going to test them. Um, I would certainly consider them a suspect from the get-go, but I'm not sure I would, I would, uh, waste a test on them uh, unless they're having symptoms. Because again, they, they may have a negative test on day three, but a positive one on day 10. So uh, I'm, I'm not really sure uh, if you were going to test them at what time point you'd do it. So certainly if they develop symptoms, that's an obvious time to test them. Well, and can, can I make a comment? Yes. There was uh, several questions that came up about uh, what to do about the patient with rheumatic disease on our therapies who's who's in contact with someone who now has COVID. Um, and I'd like you to know, I, I, this is something the panel discussed um, and there's no firm data, but I think good clinical judgment would be is that you would hold the anti-rheumatic therapy, the immunosuppressive molecules for 14 days uh, to ensure that they were not infected before you restarted. I mean, Kevin's already commented about the difficulty in testing on the asymptomatic patient. Um, who may be exposed. And I think at least with regard to the therapies we're using, my bias would be, and what I tell my patients is, hold your medicines for two weeks. All of the drugs that we use outside of corticosteroids all have prolonged effects. And you really, the chance that they're gonna flare after stopping their methotrexate, their leflutamide, their mofetil, their biologics within 14 days is pretty low. And that would be a safe bet. Many patients are reassured when we tell them that. I don't know what the other panel members think, but that's certainly what I do uh, clinically. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that seems like very good, sensible advice. And there were some really heated uh, discussions about this on the panel. Does anyone else on the panel have anything to add? I just uh, second that and say we did have a lot of discussion about these exact situations with rheumatic disease patients. And there again, the um, idea of disease activity came up and we were talking about stable patients who have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or another rheumatic disease which is under good control and certainly um, usual clinical practice is to hold um, methotrexate, et cetera, for a couple of weeks if they've been had a known exposure or developing an infection. And then we did talk about patients who have 
you know, life-threatening disease, lupus nephritis, vasculitis, et cetera, where we don't have the luxury of holding the medication for so long, perhaps. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? Okay, if not, we're gonna go to the next question. Um, this question I'm gonna send back to Ted. Ted, do we know whether COVID-19 causes rheumatic disease, such as PMR, rheumatoid arthritis, or other rheumatic disease? But this was a very interesting question submitted by one of our members. Yeah, Ellen, I, um, clearly the presentation of COVID-19 can have lots of overlap with many of the conditions we see. And I think the question that we um, were given before this call was actually specific to, to polymyalgia rheumatica. And in the early cohort studies from China, et cetera, obviously a significant proportion of those patients have uh, marked uh, inflammatory responses, acute phase responses, and many have myalgias and muscle girdle pain. There have been case reports of patients with rhabdomyolysis uh, with uh, COVID-19. So I think there's a lot of overlap uh, from symptoms, whether that is whether COVID-19 is a trigger uh, for well-established rheumatic diseases, I think at this point really unknown. And it's something we'll have to be um, watching for in, the, in our evidence uh, search. Well, Ellen, let me just add one other little wrinkle to that that uh, made the front page of the New York Times, which is the association, potential association with Kawasaki's. Yes, we absolutely. Question about that. I don't know if anyone in the panel wants to try to take that on, but is that uh, an association that um, is pathophysiologically rational and should we be concerned about that as uh, the case reports are obviously few in number now, but uh, the burden of this disease is, is picking up. And that's the one I was thinking of with this question, yes. Anyone on the panel have any insights into Kawasaki disease and COVID? Well, we should have included a pediatric rheumatologist in our group, but uh, going to obviously need we, need, we need a little more evidence around We're going to need them, yes, definitely. All right, uh, well, next I'm gonna go to you, Ken. Um, I think we have more questions coming in yeah. through the Q&A box. Yeah, we really have some great questions come in, and I regret we may not have time to cover them all tonight, but we certainly uh, appreciate everybody's uh, active participation. Um, a number of the questions actually relate to topics that the guidelines uh, the guidance document, rather, did not cover. And um, as Ted and others have mentioned, this is a living document. We're planning to update this, and we're also planning uh, through this task force to uh, take on new topics. One of the questions that, that's been raised that I think we ought to just throw out to the panel, though, and that I think is um, on everybody's mind, is what about IL-17 inhibition in the setting of particularly spondyloarthropathy? Is, um, is that... So should we be thinking about that similarly to the way we approach the, um, the other biologics and, and non-biologic DMARDs and the uh, small molecules? And so I'll start maybe, um, Michael, do you want to have a crack at that uh, to start off with or Stan? Either one of us. I mean, I would think at this point uh, you would have to uh, put that in, in the same category, uh, lacking any uh, good data. Um, I think that uh, uh, with the uh, suggestions that the task force has come up with as far as continuing therapy in the absence of uh, presumptive infection or with presumptive infection, I think uh, you would, uh, I might personally, we'll see what Mike has to say, I would uh, follow the, the, the recommendations that we've made today. Yes, Stan, I would agree. I mean, and Kevin might want to comment about this. I mean, I, at this point in time, I would, yeah, again, I would maintain the drugs. And as we've talked about in the guidance document, in patients with well-controlled disease, patients on their own are stretching out their interval of dosing if they're well-controlled. I think one of the pivotal points we talked about is the critical issue of controlling inflammatory disease at the dosing and intervals required. But in patients with low disease activity and or remission, it would not be inappropriate actually to try to stretch out the interval of dosing to try to maintain response. Kevin, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I'm just, I, I agree with um, everything you guys said. I also say that Joel, I just helped Joel Gelfand uh, a project. We did a meta-analysis of all the uh, psoriasis trials with IL-17 and 
you know, our primary focus was to see if there was in, any sort of increased you know, risk of viral respiratory infections uh, with those drugs. And, you know, that's a hard thing to study. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of these respiratory infections, you, you assume they're viral, but you don't really know. So, you know, with all the caveats of those type of studies being made, we, we did see an increased risk. It was, it was small, but it was statistically significant. And um, so, you know, for whatever that's worth, I don't know how it translates to COVID. Um, and, but, but we do think there probably is some slight increased risk and it's probably very modest or mild. And uh, I, would, I would consider the same type of strategies you're, you're suggesting as for the other drugs. Um, the other thing I'll notice, psoriasis patients sort of different, uh, you know, a different risk. You know, many of them are male, many of them have higher BMI. So it's a lot of the risk factors for badness with COVID that, um, that maybe RA patients or other rheumatology patients don't have. So. Yeah, I, I would note that there's a response from, you know, one of our eminent colleagues, Jeff Kalin, who's in the audience, who's, you know, sent, just sent out this text that uh, he was reviewing a, an article today from Korea on dermatological diseases on the use of biologics. And in that study, there was less COVID infection in those patients from South Korea with skin disease. So. Yeah. So we'll just have to see how it plays out. I agree. We don't really know. Um, a lot of this is, you know, being conservative uh, in the absence of knowledge. So. Good. Let's uh, move on to another topic for which there's been a number of questions, and that has to do with antiphospholipid antibodies, uh, both as a result of COVID and what to do in patients that have antiphospholipid antibodies and develop COVID. And so maybe um, Karen, Bonnie, you want to have a go at that, and some of the other panelists uh, may want to weigh in. But we've certainly been seeing a, a lot of thrombotic diatheses in the COVID population, strokes, and other problems uh, much sooner than we would expect in people that uh, are, are not necessarily otherwise at risk. So this is Bonnie. I'll I'll take a crack at that. Um, I think. It's important to differentiate between the inpatient um, and the outpatient side. In the inpatient, when you have patients who are very ill and you're seeing thrombotic events in these COVID-infected patients, um, it, it makes sense to, if it's, unless it's incredibly um, contraindicated, to anticoagulate those patients. I think the, the bigger question, which is really an unknown, I saw that someone had asked, is what do we do in the outpatient setting, either somebody who has pre-existing antiphospholipid antibodies but does not have antiphospholipid syndrome, or empirically because maybe some of these patients are gonna develop antiphospholipid antibodies. The, the latter is a little easier to answer because we know that infectious diseases, so for example, HIV infected patients will develop antiphospholipid antibodies, but for many of those patients, they're not pathologic, they're not the coagulant. Um, so I think in a patient who, I think what we don't know is in this particular virus, are they going to be pathologic or not? Are they just going to be the presence of an antibody? And I think we really do need more information because currently in patients who don't have clinical manifestations of antiphospholipid syndrome, the presence of antibodies don't push us to fully anticoagulate them. So I'm not, I, if you ask my, and I don't have any, there's no data, but I wouldn't anticoagulate patients in the outpatient setting just on the basis of the presence of antibodies. It's a little trickier when you have somebody who has the antibodies and then they get COVID. Is this going to be the second hit that throws them over the threshold to develop a pot? I honestly can't answer that question. Karen, any additional comments? Yeah, I would just reiterate, I think there are lots of questions in um, and in and around antiphospholipid antibodies and the intersection of people who have symptomatic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, who have have known low tidal antiphospholipid antibodies, have never had a clotting event, whether COVID, um, in terms of our other question about whether COVID-19 is related to um, the appearance of any rheumatic disease. I, I was actually thinking about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, maybe one um, disease that pops up. We know that other infections do lead to, as Bonnie was just saying, to antiphospholipid antibodies. But we also know that COVID-19 actually 
um, and maybe it's just synergy um, affects the vascular endothelium, and there have been a lot of these thrombotic events in some reports of, of increased numbers of patients with antiphospholipid antibodies, and then the appearance of these um, uh, COVID toes that look like our patients with Raynaud's and chillblains, um, with um, actually vasculopathy on biopsy. So there's a lot of, of um, intersections, and there, there is a lot of unknown as well. I think that Bonnie's recommendations for um, treating outpatients different than inpatients makes a lot of sense. And um, I would be most concerned about people with known antiphospholipid antibody syndrome who are very severely ill as inpatients with COVID-19 and their coagulant risks. So, yeah, I, could I just make a comment? Because there, there's some comments that have come in about this issue about clotting. Uh, as many of you know, to, uh, there's a uh, report now in the New England Journal about the presence of lupus anticoagulant and abnormal coagulation tests in patients with COVID-19. I don't, I, I'm not involved in the inpatient care of our COVID patients, but our clotting service is basically seeing all of the patients admitted to the hospital, to the Brigham. And if you're in the ICU, you clearly are being anticoagulated unless there's a risk for anticoagulation. And they're using higher doses than previously used in other patients. So there, at least our inpatient service is very oriented towards the clotting issue, and many of our patients are getting more than routine prophylactic anticoagulation therapy. Great. Uh, I'd just weigh in on Michael's comment. I, it's definitely at our institution and at others, uh, anticoagulant therapy has become uh, a routine practice for people meeting certain criteria who are critically ill uh, with COVID because of this phenomenon. Do any of the panelists want to take a crack at the pathogenesis of the thromboembolic uh, events that occur in COVID? Well, let's open that up a little more, Ellen, because there are some other questions about the immune response to COVID and what role uh, that may have or not have in uh, the safety or lack thereof of some of our therapies. There are some questions about, should we be more concerned about drugs that affect uh, T cells? So cyclosporin, tacrolimus, uh, uh, Mycophenolate should we be more worried about that, and what about uh, the preferential effects on the on the innate immune response, and what impact does that have in terms of how we think about our therapies? Uh, so I'd be interested in uh, hearing from the panelists, and maybe uh, Ted, you want to start out, or uh, Michael, in terms of what your thoughts are about um, particularly the T cell response. Yeah, I mean, I, so my answer will be shorter and then I'll quickly hand this off. I mean, I think we don't, we, the shorter answer is we don't really know, again. Um, there's some, some data that some of these therapies, you know, when we were talking about this as a panel, there was some data of antiviral activities of some of these therapies, which you have to counter against immunosuppressive effects. So cyclosporin, for instance, uh, shows, you know, antiviral activities in vitro. Um, there's one study with uh, MERS uh, that showed actually that MMF was associated with better outcomes, patients who are on MMF. Um, so you have to counter, you counter that data with other data suggesting, um, uh, you know, that we know that uh, in terms of infection risk. Um, you know, so I, I don't think we really know, um, specifically if you go agent by agent, I, I don't think we know, but I'd be very interested to see, Kevin, if you have other thoughts on that um, or others. And let me, let me add something to it that's come up as well as rituxan and um, neutralizing antibody response. And should we be monitoring um, for uh, B cells when we're using uh, rituxan in the setting of COVID? So maybe uh, Kevin wants to take that on as, as that relates to infection risk. Um, sure, that's an easy question. <laughs> we, of course, have no idea. I, I mean, there was a, the only reports I really am aware of with regard to B cells is, you know, there was a report out of Italy recently uh, of seven patients, you know, two, two had a gamma, a gamma globulinemia and, and five had CDID. And, you know, the, the two infected with COVID and a gamma globulinemia did absolutely fine. And the five CDID patients all did pretty, pretty poorly. That's all I got right now um, on B cells and the risk. Uh, I I don't know. I, I really don't know that Rituxa is going to pose a risk. Um, it, it may, uh, I guess, 
hamper the development of long-term immunity if someone is exposed. Um, again, but all the caveats here, knowing we don't really know what long-term immunity means and it may not be long-lasting anyway. Uh, if those changes next year, who knows? So, I mean, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of unknowns. And at this point, um, I'm not, um, I, I'm not as worried about rituximab necessarily as some of the other drugs. But again, it's all, it's all theoretical. As, as you know, Ted noted, some of, some of these drugs have great in vitro activity against certain viruses. Um, get into trials. A lot of these drugs, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, MMF, attack. You know, a lot of these drugs we think about as being problematic from an infection standpoint, and they are. Um, you know, they have in vitro antiviral activity against you know flu or dengue or what you name the virus, and then haven't shown that in vivo either in animal models or human models. So, um, you know, the jury's still out with hydroxychloroquine. I, I'm not impressed with uh, any data so far. Uh, the last several studies have been quite negative. So, um, so again, we're, we're, we're searching for an antiviral that, that is not just antiviral uh, in vitro, but also uh, in humans. Let me just uh, put a little twist on that because the, the other thing that surprisingly we haven't talked about yet is cytokine storm. And uh, it was stated up front that the purpose of this guidance document was not to uh, wade into the water of what to do therapeutically with our drugs and COVID, and hopefully we'll ultimately have some good clinical trial data that speak to that. But um, what if patients are already on these drugs? And, and Ted, perhaps you want to comment a little bit about how the panel considered this, particularly as it relates to interleukin-6 inhibition in um, decisions to stop or not to stop some of these drugs. And Ted, perhaps you can comment on some of the recent studies that have been uh, coming out that seem rather conflicting about anti-L6 therapy. Yeah, um, so to somewhat, somewhat backtracking with what I said earlier, there, there has been data looking at, you know, limited data, cohort case series, looking at patients with uh, inflammatory diseases on biologics, I mentioned the NYU study, I mentioned the Lombardi study earlier that, you know, in some ways are reassuring um, that patients on biologics uh, in the NYU study seem to get uh, admitted to the hospital at a rate similar to the, to the general population. In Lombardi study, uh, psoriasis patients on biologics, uh, including IL-17 agents that we mentioned earlier, about 50% of them were on IL-17 agents that population uh, was not at increased risk for uh, poor outcomes defined by ARDS, ICU admission, or mortality. So you know, somewhat reassuring. In terms of folks on IL-6, this was a uh, relatively long discussion of the task force, um, you know, what to do with these therapies. And I think, um, I think in an ideal world, um, we'd all like to see more data. There are IL-6 studies ongoing. There was one reported uh, with um, uh, serolimab uh, not long ago with somewhat, um, uh, you know, maybe others can comment, but somewhat uh, inconsistent results across the population seem to me maybe protective of people with severe, uh, with severe disease, um, so I think really we still are in a data gap here in terms well, of... Well, we should note that most of what's been released has been press releases or reports uh, from the right. private sector. We haven't seen uh, the RCT data yet uh, via peer review, and so we're eagerly awaiting that, and I think that will be uh, very helpful. Uh, I've been informed that we're at the top of the hour, so I think we need to start to uh, regrettably bring this great discussion to a close. Um, I guess I'd ask the panelists as they've looked through these questions, are there one or two questions that uh, people are just dying to answer? There's one here about BCG vaccination, which is fascinating. I don't know if we want to take that on in sort of the final minute or two here and um, any other topics that uh, we can bring up in closing. Ken, I think the topic of non-steroidals ought to at least be mentioned. Do Please. Like that on, Michael? Yeah, well, I mean, there's been a lot in the lay press um, uh, that uh, NSAIDs 
because its effects on the receptors in the lung could lead to deleterious outcome in patients with COVID, and there's very little data to support this. Um, we did recommend that non steroidals be held in the hospitalized patient, and that wasn't because of the COVID issue. It really was just medical practice, is that we didn't want to confound the care of these really sick patients with potential toxicities from NSAIDs. But as far as routine rheumatological care, you know, in, in your outpatients, we did not recommend that non steroidals be stopped if they were tolerating. And I don't know if the other members of the panel feel differently, but that was at least my impression. All right, well, maybe on that note, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ellen to, uh, to wrap us up and uh, bring this uh, discussion to a close. And I wanna personally thank um, Ted for leading this effort and all of the uh, people on this panel for being advisors to us, as well as the others who are uh, co-authors on this report. And I look forward to uh, working with everyone to address some of these issues that uh, came up tonight that uh, hopefully will be pending some important data and uh, at a minimum will be things that we will need to bring uh, expert consensus together around to uh, help guide our practice. So Ellen. All right, thanks very much, Ken. If I could have the next slide. I just wanna thank the panel for this really terrific discussion tonight and many thanks to the rheumatology community for your questions and your engagement this evening. Your questions were fantastic as well. Um, our goal tonight has just been to assist the rheumatology community to care for your patients with these clinical recommendations during the pandemic. And in addition to the work of this task force, we've also convened a second task force that has addressed practice and advocacy issues. And that task force has developed resources to help members address drug shortages and to provide support for telehealth information how to get federal stimulus relief aid, guidance for infusions, and many other uh, issues were taken on by that task force. And in addition, the ACR has provided support for the Global Rheumatology Alliance, which is now a section of the ACR. And links to all of these resources can be found by visiting the ACR website at www.rheumatology.org. Um, so on the last slide, I think you'll see the publication that's in Arthritis in Rheumatology. I want to thank everyone who's participated in this town hall. And if you have additional questions that we weren't able to get to tonight, please email them to us at covid.rheumatology.org. In addition, this recording will be available on our website by the end of the day tomorrow. And with that, I'd like to again thank everyone. We hope that this town hall has been helpful to you and have a great night. Night.